Ukraine Today is joined by the managing director of Jacobs Cordova and Associates, a man with 30 years of regulatory reforms experience, someone who has advised governments in 110 countries, Mr. Scott Jacobs. Mr. Jacobs, welcome to Ukraine Today. Thank you very much. Mr. Jacobs, I understand you arrived to Ukraine just last month. I understand you will be advising Ukrainian government as well. Can you tell what is your mission right now? Well, we've been delighted to be invited to work with the government of Ukraine at this crucial moment, this period of economic downturn, which requires decisive action. It's Minister Abramovichus and his colleagues are looking at a range of options to stimulate the economy, to accelerate the recovery. And one of the options they're looking at is what's been called around the world the option of the regulatory guillotine, which is a, a brutal sounding name, but it's a, it's, a, it's a structured reform that would enable the government to fairly quickly examine this enormous legacy of rules and regulations and procedures and paperwork that have built up in Ukraine over many years and to decide what does Ukraine need now? What, what makes sense for the country going forward? And that's the nut of this project. Mr. Jacobs, uh, can we talk a little bit about your experience? I understand you have a profound experience in regulatory reforms. You have worked in, two in the administrations of two U.S. presidents. Uh, you have worked in the OECD, um, advising um, on the regulatory reforms of uh, 30 top richest countries in the world. Uh, can, you, can you say a few words about that? Well, this, this, uh, the last 30 years has been uh, an enriching experience in terms of finding out how difficult it is to change how governments rule, regulate, how, how they relate to the market. I, I did start in the regulatory office under President Reagan. Over the years, what we've discovered is that countries are actually facing similar challenges. The, the challenges that Ukraine is facing today are not that different. These challenges of outdated rules and procedures that are cumbersome and unclear, uh, corruption through the administrative process, uh, a government that, that, that because it hasn't adapted quickly enough can't meet the needs of the modern country. And this, this challenge is one that I, I think Ukraine is, is, is in very good company around the world. Well, um, I understand this is not your first time um, advising to Ukrainian government and obviously you are aware uh, uh, of the big cancer of Ukrainian economy being corruption, uh, which has penetrated uh, the, the Ukrainian business, the Ukrainian society on all the levels. And uh, for 23 years, Ukraine did not manage to, to fight corruption. Do you think it will be possible to do it now, at this stage? I was very interested to see a statement from the World Bank, uh, which is uh, supporting my, my work here along with SECO that corruption is probably the single most important issue that businesses face here in Ukraine. It's a, it's a very serious matter because when you have widespread corruption, it's hard to be an honest business. The honest businesses are forced to compete on a, basically on an unfair playing field. So it's very important to get that right. The, the, um, the guillotine process, which examines well, in Ukraine uh, upwards of 10,000 different rules and procedures, would look particularly at where corruption can occur. It'll look at those areas where there's too much discretion or lack of clarity or lack of accountability on the part of the public administration and these are where corruption tends to creep in. So these are the kinds of things that can be fairly easily corrected in the legal text. It's more difficult to correct you know, the cultures and habits of the bureaucracy on the ground and probably some businesses in Ukraine also depend on corrupt relationships to keep running. So what, what the, the process of changing the habits that have grown up over decades into a transparent, market-based, client-oriented regulatory regime are really formidable. The guillotine process is a, is a good first step, but by no means is it the, the last step. Do you have confidence in the Ukrainian government that it will be able to do something in the nearest future and will be able to do fast? You know, if not now, if not now, when? I mean, this is the time. This is the opportunity. E every government comes to a time when it's time for change. And those times don't come very often. This is the time. Uh, I have had only positive discussions in the government. I, I, there's, there's widespread recognition that this is an inescapable challenge, the task that must be met, and it's time to make, meet it. 
uh, the, uh, the work of the Easy Business team, which has led to uh, several deregulations in the past few months, you know, has been a, a good sign. Uh, civil society businesses have already seen a little relief. There needs to be much more relief. So yes, this is the time. Uh, civil society seems ready to support this. Uh, the, uh, the Minister of Economy and, and others fully understand the importance of this process in the transition of Ukraine toward a more westward looking, a more uh, open, a more competitive economy within the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement of the European Union. So yes, I, I, I am uh, confident that the government will continue this work. With war raging in eastern Ukraine, do you think that Ukraine will be able to move forward with these reforms or it has first to finish the war and then go forward with the, the government reforms? government has to do many things at the same time. Uh, in the past three years, I was working with the government in Baghdad. And of course, you know, they also have some military problems in Iraq. Some. And uh, yet they were able to carry forward. You know, uh, clearly enormous attention must be placed on the immediate crisis of the security situation. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, and that's also important for the economy as well. Uh, but at the same time, the government can move forward on many fronts. I, I, I think the important point is to set some priorities. And for, for me, the priority in Ukraine today is the, is the microeconomy, the real economy. All of the small businesses, innovators, entrepreneurs, and investors in Ukraine who want to create a better life. They're here. War or not, they want to go to work. And well, I think the first focus should be on getting them to work, facilitating their activities, getting the economy moving at the, at the, at the real level. And so, yes. Absolutely, they can do it. Well, um, obviously, um, the, uh, the regulatory process, the issuing of license, is one of the main source of corruption uh, in any country, and Ukraine yes. is not, uh, is not an, uh, an exception. Uh, with the reform which you are discussing, with the guillotine re reform, uh, this literally means cutting off the hand which is feeding you. Uh, and you said that you see <laughs> that you see that you see the willingness at the top levels of the Ukrainian government to fight with this corruption. Yes. But uh, do you? The, and you are here under the auspices of the World Bank. So does the World Bank see that there is a real uh, willingness to make concrete steps yes. towards reforming the Ukrainian economy, Ukrainian business, in such a way that to eliminate corruption? Are they really ready to? To guillotine. You know, I don't think the World Bank. Are they prepared? I don't think the World Bank has authorized me to speak on its behalf, so I, I won't. I won't take that from uh, your perspective. That challenge on, but um, look, the the um, the challenge of reform is clear. It's more clear now than it's ever been. The the um, the opportunities and pressures are here, uh, particularly the the move toward the the single market of Europe, which is an enormous and historic change. In, uh, in countries which have gone through this kind of change, and I'm, here I'm thinking of Mexico when it entered the NAFTA agreement. You know, a small economy entering open borders with the largest economy in the world. And Mexico thought they would be swallowed up. The, they, was, they, they, were, they were frightened of this kind of this opening. And in a way, Ukraine is in this position. Ukraine is opening its borders, it's opening its, its, its uh, markets, it's opening so many things to, to Europe. And, this process, the one I'm talking about, is actually a self-preservation process. It's, it's preparing the country to succeed in the new environment. And I, I think that understanding is really becoming quite, quite clear, that, that Ukraine, when it enters you know, uh, the European markets, can succeed, it can prosper, but only if it's prepared itself, if it has got a good regulatory regime in place, if businesses can innovate and grow, without the burdens of corruption or unnecessary rules. That understanding I see in the government. And, and so do I see uh, that the government is ready to move forward? I think so, but of course it's up to the government to, to demonstrate that it is. You were in Ukraine in 2005. It was also un after the, another, the revolution, the Orange Revolution. And back then, the expectations of, of, of the people, of the, of the ordinary Ukrainians, were also very high. Everybody thought that after this Orange Revolution, things will change. Yes. Unfortunately, they didn't. Yes. Do you, th do you think this time this is something different, or we'll live through another phase? No, I, I sense a real difference, a real difference compared to 2005. The, the government is, 
is far more open and responsive to what they're hearing from the public. In, in 2005, um, I, I would still call it the age of bureaucracy. The, 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 the bureaucrats, um, and, and, and I, I was once a bureaucrat myself, I don't use the term uh, in criticism, but the, the bureaucrats were still following old patterns and habits and there was kind of very little pressure on them to change. Things are different now and quite, quite different. So you mentioned resistance early on. You know, we obviously cannot carry out a reform like this by asking regulators and ministries to reform themselves. They're, they're too stuck in a, in a mode of behavior for various reasons. In countries where we've worked, when we've asked the ministries to develop their own recommendations for change, they only come up with about 10% of the recommendations that are finally generated. So we need to create a much broader momentum for reform. It's one reason why this is so transparent, because when you have a public reform in which the reasons for the reform, the, the particulars of the reform have been debated and widely understood, it's quite hard for a special interest to stop it. At this point, it's, it's too transparent. The special interests are strongest in the shadows. So we put a lot of light on this reform. Mr. Jacobs, uh, with Ukraine's economy in tatters, with Ukraine's currency uh, having devaluated for more than 200%, uh, the reforms which now is being suggested by the Ministry of Economy uh, are going to be harsh. And they will definitely affect, as you have said yourself, the small and medium businesses. Do you think that these small and medium businesses will be able to survive, given all these factors? Yes, they must. They must survive. I, the, it, it, under conditions like this, of course, the, 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 the challenges ahead for these small businesses are enormous. Uh, and yet, people must make a living. People must create opportunity. People must do whatever they need to do for their lives. The role of the government in this case is to give them freedom. Mo one of the principles of the, the, the guillotine process is, is economic freedom. If you have a skill, use it. If you have an idea, innovate it. Put it into the market. If you have energy, work harder. I mean, the, the, the people of Ukraine, war or not, hard times or not, must grow the, through this process in which they work, they innovate, they create new value, they create wealth. The role of the government in this case is to give them the freedom to do that. Unfortunately, many of these rules and regulations are the opposite. They actually damage the ability of people to go to work, to innovate, to invest, to grow. So uh, at the very minimum, while the government cannot shield them from all shocks like energy price shocks and currency shocks, the government can make life easier for them in, in their relationships vis-a-vis -vis the bureaucracy and vis-a-vis -vis the government. And those are very important factors. What we've seen is that in countries that have gone through this kind of reform, the, uh, the SME sector does tend to grow faster. Uh, we see that uh, the country becomes more competitive. Uh, we see that business confidence goes up so that investment goes up. Uh, so there's a lot of things that can happen a little faster, a little better, if we can get this reform in place. From your experience, uh, how long this reform will take place? When will the small and medium businesses see the results of this reform? Well, let me say that the government hasn't adopted the reform yet. So, I mean, let's, let's, let's proceed on the assumption that the government does decide to go forward. If the government decides to go forward with this kind of reform, uh, we would set uh, clear uh, priorities and targets and there would be some relief felt within weeks. We would move very quickly. The whole reform process is designed to go for 36 months and there would be many, many stages of reform. So there would be an unfolding program of relief that went on for the whole 36 months before it was completed. So you, you, this is not a, a, a medium-term program. This is designed to work within a, a, an urgent situation in which recovery is the top priority. Well, let's hope that Ukrainian government does adopt this reform and goes forward with this reform. Uh, Mr. Jacobs, many thanks for coming to us and talking to us. This was Volodymyr Sokol for Ukraine Today, together with the Managing Director of Jacobs, Cordova & Associates, economic consulting firm. Thank you for watching us.